Support for this program is provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation of Jennings. The Ziegler Museum is a cultural center for Southwest Louisiana, featuring European and American art and wildlife dioramas. Additional support for the Louisiana Veterans Coming Home Project provided by Entergy. Active duty, reservist, and military veterans make up nearly 10% of Entergy's Louisiana workforce. Entergy values the dedication, discipline, and skills of these brave men and women. Entergy and veterans, together we power life. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. So we're asking people to continue to be cautious. Don't let your guard down. Concern from the governor after a brush with Tropical Storm Cindy. Hi, everyone. I'm Andre Morrow. Right now on the state we're in, Cindy's winds never topped 60 miles an hour and wide scale flooding never happened. But take a look at Grand Isle a full day before landfall, and this was nowhere near the storm center. Roads underwater, major damage to the island's burrito levee. Coastal parishes got the worst of it. Now, Cindy came ashore west of Cameron, and though disorganized, it still spawned tornadoes and heavy rain from Texas to Florida. And in Alabama, a young boy on vacation died when a wave pushed a large log over him. The governor declared a disaster declaration in advance of the storm. The floods of 2016 forced 56 of 64 parishes to be declared disaster areas. We've got an update now on Louisiana Congressman Steve Scalise. Doctors say the majority whip is making good progress and has been upgraded to fair condition. A week ago, he was shot during a practice with other Republicans for a charity baseball game in Alexandria, Virginia. He's undergone a number of surgeries since that rogue gunman shot him in the hip. It shattered blood vessels and bones. U.S. Capitol Police returned fire and killed the gunman. Well, it almost reaches the Jimmy Kimmel test. That's the word from Louisiana Senator Bill Cassidy about the latest version of the Republican health care bill. Cassidy hasn't said yet if he'd vote for the bill, but believes its reforms put it on a good path that he says is good for the patient and good for state and federal taxpayers. He said if the debate extends beyond the July 4th recess, that is fine with him. Now to a story that is certain to have you talking and maybe wondering, why didn't I think of that? It's new technology that could change the way Louisiana and the world, in fact, fights oil spills. Can you believe a sponge invented and developed at a national lab in Chicago is the key component? A sponge. LPB's Kelly Spires takes you through how this seemingly simple idea could well be the next big thing. Jeffrey Elam is the principal chemist on the project. He helped produce this oil soaking sponge called the Oleo sponge. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. Can you tell us how this sponge is different from the way we fight oil spills today? Well, the way that we fight oil spills today, that is to say uh, oil slicks that are, uh, that are floating on the top of the ocean, would be to use uh, either a skimmer or a boom. A boom is essentially uh, like uh, an inflatable uh, corral, or it, it can be uh, cleaned up using a skimmer. This is something that is similar to a vacuum hose. One of the main uh, points to make, though, is that there are currently no uh, technologies for cleaning up oil that is in the form of uh, droplets, which are suspended uh, in the water column, so below the surface. So until the oleo sponge, there was really no way of, uh, of attacking that challenge. This is a sponge. Is there a way to wring out this sponge? Absolutely. We've been doing in our tests, if it's a small uh, amount, you can simply squeeze it with your fingers. For the larger testing that we've done, uh, we have literally sent it through a wringer that would uh, squeeze it. Therefore, we could recover all the crude oil that we, that we cleaned up in these, uh, in these pilot scale tests that we did. So yes, it's simple to, uh, to extract the oil that it has absorbed and then you can just go ahead and use it again. Can you tell us what the material feels like? Um, from the photos and videos that I've seen, it kind of looks like a kitchen sponge meets chain link. Um, <laughs> could you, <laughs> what, what allows this material to do what it does and, and what does it 
feel like? Just like any other sponge, it, our, our starting material is polyurethane, and that's used in things like mattresses and pillows. So it's very soft. The chain mail, was, it, it was encased in these, in these bags, these nylon mesh bags, and that was just something that we did for convenience so that we could have a lot of it uh, in the form of a pad. The one thing I will mention, though, is after we do this treatment to it, this chemical treatment that converts the ordinary polyurethane uh, foam into the oleo sponge. Uh, it still feels just as squishy, but it also feels kind of dry on your fingers. And that's because it's so good at absorbing oil that it actually will pull the oil off of the surface of your fingers. Can you tell us about the underlying technology and, and maybe what else could be done with it? It's a two-step process. And in the first step, we do what can be thought of as a priming of the of the sponge surface. So we subject the, uh, the polyurethane foam to uh, a series of uh, chemical vapors which uh, do a chemical reaction on the surface to put down a very thin layer of uh, something called alumina, which is actually ceramic. So it still stays squishy because the layer is you know, below one nanometer in thickness. So this, this first step uh, primes uh, the surface to uh, accept uh, the next chemical in the second step, which is the, the oleophilic or oil-loving uh, compound. And in addition, that oleophilic monolayer, uh, we could imagine uh, attaching other kinds of monolayers on there that might be uh, uh, favorable to absorb something like uh, heavy metal ions or organic contaminants of a certain kind. Is the sponge costly to make? I'm wondering what the steps are between now and when the sponge gets out into the world. The raw materials that we're using, the poly, uh, polyurethane foam um, and the chemicals for those two steps uh, are quite inexpensive. And so, you know, we've done cost estimates and it, it turns out that it's, uh, you know, comparable in price to existing uh, sorbent products that, that, that are marketed now for doing uh, oil cleanup, with the exception, with the exception that those existing products can only be used once. So you use them once and then you have to throw them away along with the oil that they soaked up, whereas ours, ours can be used over and over. As a national lab, we really need commercial partners in order to uh, bring this stuff out into the marketplace. So we're talking with a number of companies now, and if they're uh, willing to commit some of their resources to uh, to further develop this so it can be made at scale, then I, I would imagine in, in you know several years it could be uh, available for places like Louisiana to, to use out in the field. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for talking with us, and thank you for the work that you've done. Uh, my pleasure. Kelly, thanks for the report. We'll keep you posted. In a move to undo a signature legacy of his predecessor, President Donald Trump will redraw U.S. policy toward Cuba, tighten travel restrictions, and ban U.S. business transactions with Cuba's military. Louisiana state leaders say trade relationships involving state agriculture, though, should remain solid. Just look where we are and where Cuba is. The distance from New Orleans to Havana about 670 miles. It all adds up to what state leaders say is a natural fit, and geographically, it just plain makes sense. Louisiana's rich agricultural advantage is a given. An abundance of rice, soybeans, sugarcane, poultry, and more. Cuba imports $2 billion in food a year, with the U.S. providing almost half of that. Louisiana is by far the biggest individual player of those exports, but Agriculture Commissioner Mike Strain believes the untapped potential is huge. We're talking a big win with big revenue for the state and tremendous help for a country that is desperate for it. The promising economic possibilities aren't limited to what's planted in the ground. Tourism and the cruise industry could also reap big benefits, thanks to our vast port system among the biggest in America. Much of that promise has hinged on trade restrictions being lifted. But President Donald Trump changed the narrative with a new stance on Cuba. Will it set Louisiana goals back? Now, in the nine years since he became the state's Ag and Forestry Commissioner, Mike Strain has worked hard to cultivate relationships with Cuba. And until this past week, things have gone very, very well. And now, we sat down and talked with him about where we stand with Cuba. Mike, in spite of what's happened this past week, you say you remain optimistic. I am very optimistic. And if you look at what's happened in the last week, you know, we basically laid out the parameters. You know, this is what, you know, the administration in Washington wants to see. You know, this is where we're at. And of course, now is when the time when our ambassadors go to work. You know, we have still have 
you know, our ambassador in Cuba, the Cuban ambassador in the United States. We are putting together new trade ministers for agriculture and for the United States. And so when you look at all the things going on, and especially that we have a bill in the House and a different bill in the Senate, United States House and Senate, dealing with trade parameters specifically for agriculture. And also what I've been told by the administration that this should have a minimal effect directly on agricultural trade. But when you look at where we're at, and again, let's put all this on the table, and I've been saying for a long time, more than a year, let's put the issues on the table, whatever they are, and let's start talking about them, and let's find a way where we can reestablish trade, while whatever that mechanism is, however long it takes. But the main thing we have to do is start talking about it and have to start these negotiations in earnest, as we are with trade negotiations with Canada, Mexico, Trans-Pacific, Europe, all of these, and let's get on this and let's, and let's go ahead and get this in motion. You look at Cuba, they say restrictions on government activity, government officials, it wouldn't necessarily be agriculture, but doesn't the government dictate everything anyway? Well, the government is changing there. The majority of trade with Cuba goes through the government, all import, for instance. And what they were talking about, many of the enterprises, for instance, if you lease trucks, you lease them from a, a company that is owned by the military. So the, the restrictions are is that you're not gonna be able to do business with something where the profits would go, quote, to the government or to the military. However, on our last trip to Cuba, you know, we worked and we're working to where we can do d business directly with individual, the entrepreneurs, the restaurant owners, and directly with the co-ops. 60% of the agricultural land in Cuba is owned by co-ops. Mm -hmm. And what we're wanting to do is to set up a way to do business directly with them. And we have to do that by changing some of the rules where we can use our banks, where we can set up the banking, where if an individual wants to sell rice directly to a co-op, or directly to a food chain or whatever you're gonna do to where if, if that deal goes through and if someone wants to loan them credit, not the government, private individuals, private banks, where we can do business with them just like we do with yeah, Vietnam, mm. China, Soviet, the former Soviet republics with Russia. Our largest trading partner in the world for the United States is China. We, you know, we do business with China, we don't do business with Cuba. What well, you mentioned too, Cuba, they trade with Vietnam, but that's where you look at the geography of Louisiana. It is a natural. It makes it sense. It takes 30 days to get rice. 670 miles from New Orleans that's to right. Havana. 30 days to get rice from Vietnam to Cuba. We can get it there in two days. The new Port of Mariel, which is built with foreign dollars, $900 million of foreign investment. It is managed by a company out of Singapore. I've been there twice to the super port at Mariel, where you know we can have product there in two days. And so when you're looking at what the potential is, how we can do it, prior to the embargo, more than 63% of all trade with Cuba, import and export, was through the port of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it, so well, you know, why, why do you want to trade with Cuba? I said, simple. American citizens are going to send $1.8 billion of cash to the Cuban relatives in Cuba for them to buy food and other personal products and supplies. Well, you know what? That's American dollars mm -hmm. going, going there. Well, we, we need to sell them American products to be paid for with those American dollars. Now, you've been They'll there. Be, I've been there twice. You've been there twice. In, in July in, and in September. In the past uh, recent year and a half Since or so. Since July. But you've worked on this for nine, nine years. years? Nine years. And a lot of people don't know that. Nine years we've worked diligently trying to set this up and develop these relationships. And, it's a, and trade is about relationships. And if you look at, at the countries that we trade with, you know, we have 20 trade agreements of these large trade agreements in the United States, these multilateral and unilateral trade agreements. And the majority of our trade in the United States is with these entities we have these trade agreements. And if you look at what does it mean, Cuba will import about $6 billion worth of products, minimal. Two billion in agricultural products, import 80% of their food. They're gonna have four million tourists next year. Four million, it's an island of 11 million people. Those tourists currently now mostly are eating on the tourist boats because mm -hmm. there's no food for them in Cuba. They'd like to get off and eat at the restaurants. And for tourists, you have to have high quality food, high quality. We can send high quality food at competitive prices. And so when you look at what the market, we're gonna be at 2.4 billion, 2.5 billion. And if you look at what our market share could be, right, it could mm -hmm. easily be over a billion dollars. And Louisiana's about. share 
could be at least $500 million a year. Tell me about the high quality food. What are the, the top uh, agricultural exports? Well, the top about? agriculture exports are to Cuba, soybeans over 200 million, corn over 200 million, uh, poultry products, right? Poultry over 200 million, rice, rice 180 million plus dollars. When you look at all of these things, I mean, we have the largest poultry export facility for frozen poultry in this hemisphere, Port of New Orleans, New Orleans cold storage. If you look at our ability to send rice, we can ship that rice today. I mean, we are in a perfect place. We have five of the largest ports in the United States here mm -hmm. in Louisiana, and we can get that product to Cuba rapidly. And the other thing that's happening, the Port of Mariel isn't there just to service Cuba. It is a hub. It is going to become like Atlanta, Georgia is for airlines. Atlanta mm -hmm. for airlines is what Mariel is going to be for the entire Caribbean and Mexico. Container ships go in, unload, reload, and redistribute. And so if we can sell product there, then those products will be, then be redistributed across you know, Mexico and all of South America and all, and all through the, that entire region. So there's phenomenal market ability and we need to be there. And if you look at what's under, for instance, the Monroe Doctrine, anything happens in this hemisphere is our business. And we need to be an active player. We need to be an active part. We need to have trade there so that we can try to influence things, right? If not, someone else is. Let me ask you this quickly. The Cuban people, you've been there, you've seen them, their needs. They need everything. If you look at that, they're importing 80% of their food. They're asking us for seed. They're asking us for technology. They're asking us for genetics to help them with their livestock. And if you look at that, you know, you don't see many Cubans that look like me. They're thin. The Cuban people aren't having children because one, they just don't have the products to raise them. The largest group of Cubans are the older Cubans. And when you look at, they need everything. So They're, it's, every, they need so everything. so many areas where Louisiana can play a huge role, not just. Ah. With they need crops, wood products. But knowledge. Knowledge. Information. That's right. And sharing of technologies and helping them to reestablish their ability just to help feed themselves. And it's not just crops, too. Oh, it's and everything. And agriculture, because there is a tourism and there's a cruise industry that, again, geographically, That's right. we're in a wonderful position to play a role in technology. And I that think lead. we are. And I, th and I think we are. And so, uh, you know, I think from where we're at, now is the beginning of further negotiations, and we will start down that path. And we'll be watching you. It's Thank really you. good to visit it's with you It's great to be this. here. Thank you. Thank you. Veterans in Northeast Louisiana will soon be able to take a free shuttle to the VA Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi. The project is one of many offered by a relatively new chapter of the Disabled American Veterans located in Monroe. One of its members was recognized as Louisiana's 2017 Veteran of the Year. LPB senior producer Kevin Gotro has our story. In 1970, when Vietnam veteran Bill Jamison entered a California restaurant dressed in full uniform, the reception he received was far from welcoming. I had a, and I loosely call him a gentleman, come up to me, call me uh, all kinds of four-letter words, and a baby killer, and spit upon me in front of my wife and my family. Nearly 50 years later, Jamison has received national recognition from the Disabled American Veterans as Louisiana's Veteran of the Year. Out of the thousands of veterans in the DAV in Louisiana, I was chosen to be the Veteran of the Year this year, and it, it, it's very humbling. Jamison served in the U.S. Army for 15 years and was medically discharged in 1976 due to cancer. He analyzed intelligence data during the Vietnam conflict. His work for fellow veterans in the Monroe area earned him his recent award. Any bitterness Jameson felt from the California incident was buried long ago. Nowadays, uh, you know, Michael and I wear a uniform like this, or we wear a baseball cap that says Army veteran, Navy veteran, whatever. They will come up, shake our hands, tell us how proud they are to that we served our country. Michael is Michael Shaw, 
a Navy veteran of Vietnam and founder of the DAV chapter Jameson belongs to. Shaw was called to start it, he says, after spending a 110-hour week volunteering at the traveling Vietnam Wall. I guess about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, all of the names on the wall spoke to me. And it was as God spoke to me. and says, Mike, you know, all the veterans that are west of the river have service. But all of these veterans between here and the Mississippi River, they don't have band service. They don't have help with their benefits. Shaw wanted to name his chapter after General Claire Chenault, the military pilot best known for leading the Flying Tigers in World War II. He approached Chenault's granddaughter, who oversees the museum bearing his name. And I have to tell you, I took a little pause with that because my grandfather's legacy and his name is very important to me. But knowing Michael, I, I was pretty secure in saying yes, I think he would be very honored because he was a soldier through and through. And I have to say, they have certainly lived up to his legacy. Now in its fourth year, Chapter 51 of the DAV, the General Claire Chenault Flying Tigers, continues to meet at the museum and support it. When the state cut off funding to the facility two years ago, Shaw made it his mission to help plug the $100,000 shortfall. Michael spent weekends in the cold, the heat, standing on street corners in front of businesses that allowed us to do that, selling flags, and was able to sell $18,000 worth of flags in about a year and a half time. Together with Jameson, Shaw counsels veterans, helping them to secure benefits benefits many are unaware they're entitled to. In about the four years time I've made between three to four hundred thousand dollars yearly in veterans benefits just in this area. Now you wait till I get through with all those veterans between here and the Mississippi River. We're going to turn it into millions. The two men have been working over the last year coordinating what will be a free shuttle service for veterans in northeast Louisiana to the VA Medical Center in Jackson, Mississippi. They make, get an appointment at the Jackson Medical Center. They make a, a, a contact with the van service there. They set up the ride for them. We pick them up at a set location, take them to their appointments, and bring them home from their appointments. Pickup points will be in Monroe, Rayville, Delhi, and Tallulah. The 250-mile round-trip service will be a boon for area veterans. A lot of veterans can't even drive, so the fact that we have this van is going to be tremendous for all those veterans. I know we have services that go to Shreveport right now, but Jackson's one of the best VA hospitals in the whole system. Randall Rugg is a Marine who served in Operations Iraqi and Enduring Freedom. He lost a leg when five RPGs, or rocket-propelled grenades, hit the vehicle he was in. While his wife currently takes him to VA appointments, he foresees a time he'll need the shuttle. I know there's going to come a point where I'm going to be stuck in that wheelchair. I'm not going to be able to drive. They're not going to let me drive. They're not going to give me a license. They may have me on medication. That My brain may be too foggy to drive. The service will initially run twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. The chapter's goal also is to eventually secure a larger van. Chapter member or not, Shaw encourages area veterans to contact him for any type of assistance. They need to know that this country loves and respects them for what they did for us. And we need to go back out there and grab them up out of the streets and get them cared for. As for Jameson's recent honor, it's one he shares with all veterans. I feel like it's important that every veteran knows that as far as I'm concerned, they are the veterans of the year. Everyone that is out there that is a veteran is a hero. They serve their country and they deserve all the recognition and all the benefits that they rightfully deserve. Kevin, thank you for that story. We salute all of our veterans. The shuttle service is expected to begin no later than the 1st of August. For veterans in Northeast Louisiana wanting to use the service or needing advice about securing benefits, Michael Shaw encourages them to call him at the number you see on your screen. Now this story is part of Veterans Coming Home. It's LPB's ongoing coverage of issues affecting Louisiana's veterans made possible through the support of Energy. For more stories, visit veterans.lpb.org.
The threat of Tropical Storm Cindy forced work to speed up to protect a major archaeological find on the banks of the Red River near Shreveport. LPB's Rex Q. Fortenberry was there to document it for us. What you see is thought to be the largest intact Native American canoe ever found in North America. It's about 34 feet long and is carved from the trunk of a tree. Boaters stumbled on it a few weeks ago, but the threat of tropical weather forced crews to carefully move the relic. It will go to the Texas A&M Archaeological Lab for preservation and will eventually be placed on exhibition in Shreveport. We came out here and checked it out and sure enough it is a dugout that dates to the prehistoric Caddo people who lived in this area. Uh, it is almost identical to one that was found in 1983. It is now in the State Exhibit Museum. It was found a couple of miles downstream from here. The dugout that is in the museum dates to around 1100 AD, and we suspect that this one is just as old, so it's a little over 900 years old. We know that we have Caddo people who lived in a major mound center, a ceremonial center, that exists about four or five miles downstream from here. It is known as Mounds Plantation. And there were other uh, ceremonial centers that go down into Red River Parish and up into southwest Arkansas. And they were all contemporary between about 900 and 1200 AD. During that period of time, there was a huge mound center in what is now the St. Louis area of southern Illinois. And they were making all kinds of exotic goods, and including things out of copper and they were trading that all over the southeastern United States, particularly down here into the Caddo uh, cultural area. And there are items from Cahokia that have shown up down here in Louisiana. So they were moving things back and forth and probably some of it was by river. And so we know that along the Red River, these ceremonial centers were all connected to one another. That terrific find should be on display in about two years. And that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch LPB On Demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. And you can catch LPB news and public affairs shows as well as other Louisiana programs that you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook as well. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. Thanks for watching us. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter and visit lpb.org where you can view more stories and leave us a comment. This program is available on DVD. Support for this program is provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation of Jennings. The Ziegler Museum is a cultural center for Southwest Louisiana featuring European and American art and wildlife dioramas. Additional support for the Louisiana Veterans Coming Home Project provided by Entergy. Active duty, reservist, and military veterans make up nearly 10% of Entergy's Louisiana workforce. Entergy values the dedication, discipline, and skills of these brave men and women. Entergy and veterans, together we power life. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you.